Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Colossians, letter to the Colossians. I want to do something a little bit different tonight. I want to just recover the ground that we have outlined here in this book. I'm not going to re-preach the messages. I'm going to say one sentence from each message. I'm going to show the title slide and we'll just go through it and hopefully this will jog your memory a little bit of where we've been. We're in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. We'll get there in just a moment, but let's uh, review where we've gone. We spoke first of all of how the Colossians had a testimony, a Colossian testimony, and we saw that every believer ought to have a Colossian testimony of faith and sacrificial love growing out of a confidence in the future ahead of us. After that, we talked about a worthy walk. The ultimate standard for any Christian life is walking worthy of the Lord. It is a stewardship. Walking worthy of the Lord is a stewardship of the knowledge of God's will and a transformation by His grace. Then we saw that we are qualified, every believer is qualified to live a life that is worthy of God because we have been rescued from darkness and reassigned to God's kingdom. It's not about us, it's about what He's already done. We're qualified. After that, we talked about Christ the firstborn as the firstborn of creation and from the dead. Jesus Christ is the image of God and the head of the church and He is in the process of reconciling all things to God including your life and mine, Christ the firstborn. We also saw that He reconciled us. Sinners are reconciled to God in Christ's body through death in order that they may be presented to God blameless, reconciled. Then the marvelous truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the power of the Christian life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we saw Paul's agony, his agony over treasure, one of the Colossians to treasure something. A man who knows Jesus will not be enamored by cheap imitations of what he already has in Christ. He's already discovered the treasure. And then, last time, kidnapped by philosophy. The substance of the Christian life is not a set of rules, not a set of principles or behaviors. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we were really discovering the danger of a worldly approach to spiritual things. And that's what he's talking about when he uh, references philosophy. And I want you to go to verse 8 of chapter 2 and we'll pick up there. He says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. We saw those are the three characteristics of Worldly philosophy, the worldly approach to your spiritual life, they can only go to the tradition of men. What have we always done? The basic principles of the world, that's your lists. The behaviors, the things that you're supposed to do. And whatever else takes the place of the Lord Jesus Christ, a relationship with Him. They're not according to Christ. Verse 9, for in Him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. In Him, in Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances, requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Then last week we focused on the remainder of this chapter and we really dissected what it means to have a philosophy, a twisted philosophy, a twisted approach to spiritual things. We reduce the Christian life to a list of behaviors, of do's and don'ts. It's not against necessarily, um, you can categorize the Christian life by some things, but if you say, 
that your life, you identify yourself as somebody who doesn't do this and who doesn't do that and who doesn't do this and who does this and this and this, you miss the entire point. We miss the entire point to the Christian life. A Christian is somebody who knows Jesus. Somebody who has Jesus pulsating in, the, in their spirit and who is living his life together with him. Now you could point at them and say, well, they don't do this and don't do that, but that's not the focus of their life. The focus of their life is Christ. And so we discovered the negative side of this last week. And today we want to look at the positive side, the positive aspect of this. We're going to see the alternative to the world's approach to spiritual things. Paul is going to convince us that we are complete. We are filled up in Christ. And we saw the, it, as we read this passage, notice all of the in Him, with Him, in Him, with Him. Drop down to chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. And also the, the passage we just read has a number of instances of in Him, with Him. I want you to see, first of all, tonight... From chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 9. He's speaking of Christ and he says, For in Him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We want to unpack that verse, understand what that means. God's fullness dwells in Christ. What do we mean by that? What does Paul mean by that? We need to see, first of all, that men are created for the fullness of God. That's why you and I were created. Several passages, you can turn to these if you'd like, or you can listen as I read them. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. The, uh, Solomon is um, writing that he has made everything beautiful in its time. He's referring to God. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts, except no, that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. That verse is a little difficult to understand, but you get the sense that everyone, God has put eternity in their hearts. This world, despite all of their claims of agnosticism and atheism, in their heart. God has put eternity, a concept of eternity, a concept of future judgment, a conviction that life does not end at death. It goes on. And God has put that in the hearts of mankind. This verse tells us. John chapter 1, verse 9 is another passage that helps us with this, that God has made men to experience, and I'm... I'm calling this His fullness. Men are created for the fullness of God. John 1, 9, that that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now we just sort of punched in in the middle of the verse there. And we're told that John, John the Baptist, was sent to bear witness of the light. And that light is the Lord Jesus. It says that John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that light, verse 9, we just read it, was the true light. And notice what it says. It lights, it gives light to every man coming into the world. Every child that is born has light. Well, what does that mean? They're not saved, but the Lord gives them light. He gives them conviction. How many of you have a device a heater in your home that has a pilot light anybody have a pilot light my garage has a heater in it and uh, it's up in the up in the rafters and uh, during the summertime obviously I don't use my garage heater but in the wintertime oh do I use my garage heater love that thing um, but after a long summer the wind has blown through my garage countless times and sometimes I'll flip the switch and nothing will happen and you know what's happened the pilot light has gone out of my garage heater and I have to climb the ladder 
into the rafters and rip the cover off, and it's a process to light the pilot light. But it's, it's that light that is burning, and the gas um, is, is just, just a little touch of gas is coming through there, and it's enough to keep that flame going so that when we actually turn on the gas, there's something there to ignite the gas and give us controlled heat. And God is like he's lit the pilot light of our conscience. And it is, there is a concept of the fullness of God. There is an aspect in which we are aware of that. Now, what do we do with that? I want you to go to one other passage if you're turning. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Some people try to blow out their pilot light. They don't like it. Cramps their style. But we're told in Romans 1, 19 and 20, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. I'm going to start in verse 18. That'll make more sense. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They are pushing the truth down in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. Well, what do you mean? For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. But it shows us that there is something that men can go out and they can look at creation. They can see from creation that something almighty and all-powerful created this. Something transcendent created this. There is something about a sunset. I just, I'm thinking sometimes people take pictures of sunsets. And they think, well, that's beautiful. What makes that beautiful? There's something transcendent about that. There's something amazing about that. There's something powerful about that. Because we're created for that. It's hardwired into us. Now, we can do what we like with it. We try to, some people try to stamp it out. Some people try to ignore it. Some people try to blow out that conviction, try to distract themselves from it. But God, nevertheless, has put it there. And in all of our hearts, we know that God is real, He's omnipotent, and we're accountable to Him. Man is created for the fullness of God. Now, in the context here of Colossians, you remember what he's saying to these, to these believers. He's saying you need to beware because there are people going around that are, that are inviting you to this this, I, we said the, the Monday night Bible study, you know, that this preaching is great on Sunday, but come to our Monday night Bible study. We've got this, this deeper knowledge that we want to share with you. And they would say, it's just wonderful. It's changed my life. And you really need to under, understand this and get a concept of this. And so they would invite you to this separate study, if you will. And they are promising a fuller knowledge of God. And we dealt with this last week. They, are, they seem to be humble. Okay? There's something attractive about them. They're, they're self-deprecating. They're humble. And they are, they're, they are in control of their own body. They say no to their flesh. Maybe they're, they uh, have ways that they're disciplined. And that's attractive. But Paul says that their religion is, is not powerful. It's not, uh, it doesn't have the power to deliver them from sin. But they promise a fullness. And there's something, again, that we're hardwired to be attracted to. We want to know God. We're, we're want, if, we're, if we're pursuing God, we want to know Him better. We want to know Him deeper. And these Colossians were being drawn into this a little bit. And Paul says to them in, in verse 9 of Colossians 2, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Men are created for the fullness of God, but Jesus is God in bodily form. The term fullness of the Godhead refers to God's complete divine nature in all its glory. Everything there is about God is the fullness of the Godhead. The glory, the power, the transcendence, the magnificence, the holiness of God, everything about the Godhead. 
It's also used in a verse we just read in Romans 1.20. The eternal thing, the, uh, the invisible things of Him are, are revealed, being clearly seen by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. It's referring to God's divinity revealed in His creation. This term does not limit God to merely the person of Christ. Father and Spirit are co-equal and co-eternal. But nevertheless, the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ bodily. We'll get into that in just a moment. A commentator says that this expression is unusual, but the God-man relationship cannot be expressed well in human language. And if you were to study church history down through the centuries, there are huge heresies that have centered around the nature of Christ. Is He God or is He man? You may have heard a knock on your door and someone has come to your door and they've said, Hi, we're from the Watchtower Society. And the Watchtower Society is the Jehovah's Witnesses. And the Jehovah's Witnesses is an age-old heresy that started uh, over a thousand years ago called Arianism. And Arianism says that Jesus Christ is not God. He's not God. He's man. And they say Jesus Christ never claimed to be God. That is not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And that's a heresy from the pit of hell. And all of these heresies emerged uh, several hundred years, within several hundred years of Christ uh, ascending to heaven. And they, they fought these battles of who is Jesus. Is he God or is he man? Is He God and man? How do those natures coexist? But this expression captures the essence of who Jesus is. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not only that, I'm going to skip a phrase here, verse 10. We're going to talk about being complete in Him in just a minute. But it talks about He is the head of all principality and power. He's the head of all principality and power. There is no higher rank than that. Sometimes kids play games, you know, I'm I'm the chief, or I'm the chief of chiefs. I'm the president, or I'm the president of president. I'm the whatever. And they're trying to get up and up and up and higher and higher and higher. And the head of all principality and power. I don't think we can go higher than that. Principality refers to might and dominion. Power refers to authority. Jesus is the head of them all. He's disarmed principalities and powers, we're told in a few verses. We'll look at that in a moment. But He is exalted far above all of those things. All, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that God has given Him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess, uh, every, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this heresy at Colossae promised a deeper knowledge of God's nature through rev, uh, regulations, through false humility, through idolatry, and through interactions with these principalities and powers, the worship of angels that were thought to usher men into the presence of God. They would say, come on, come on, we, you need to talk. we need to talk to you about the way that we approach God. Because I, I don't know about you, but I could never approach God directly. And you feel like, you can? Well, I can. And you, you feel like, well, maybe I'm missing something. And, and they draw you back, they draw you into their, to their heresy. But Paul says, in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power But the complete knowledge and fullness of God is none other than Jesus Christ. And you could say it this way. I think this gets really practical. Jesus meets every spiritual need with Himself. I want to take you on a little journey through the book of John. This is probably my absolute favorite gospel. It is my absolute favorite gospel in the Bible, if I could get to have a favorite gospel. And this is my absolute favorite feature about the Gospel of John. And the close second probably would be John chapter 14 through 17, where Jesus explains some very precious truths. But this feature I'm about to show you is amazing to me. It's a device that John uses that I don't see elsewhere. John chapter 4, verse 25 
John 4.25. Jesus is with the woman at the well, and he has really gotten her attention by telling her everything that she's ever done, telling her how many husbands she's had. And she is trying to sidetrack him. She's brought up the age-old question of, well, where should we worship? Should it be in here in uh, Samaria or should it be down in Jerusalem? And Jesus said that doesn't really matter because the, the day is coming when everyone's going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And then the woman brings this up in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus' response to her is, I who speak to you am he. You're looking for the Messiah? I am the Messiah, he says. That is not the only place he does this. John chapter 6. Go to John chapter 6. Over several chapters. John chapter 6. He's talking to the people after he has fed them. And they want more bread. They're hungry. They want more free food. Jesus is saying to them, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and he gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. What do you think Jesus is going to say? Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You're looking for the bread that God gives. I am the bread of life. What's he doing in each of these instances? These people have a need. They're seeking for something. And Jesus says, I am what you need. You're looking for the Messiah. I am the Messiah. You're looking for the bread. I am the bread that gives life. I am the bread of life. Go to John chapter 8. He's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees here. They are disputing with him. And he is talking with them about honor. Verse 54, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. If I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. And he's claiming there to be the transcendent God that is before Abraham. They're looking for a guide. He is their guide. Go to John chapter 11, probably my favorite of these instances here. John chapter 11. Martha is in the midst of grief over the death of her brother Lazarus. And she runs to the Lord as he finally makes it there. He's purposefully delayed so that he can show his power. And he tells her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha, probably through tears, says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It's like, I know that, Lord. That's not very comforting. Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. You're looking at the resurrection, but I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14, last passage we'll go to. John 14. And in each of these instances, Jesus is proving himself to be what these people need. What did he do with Lazarus? He raised him from the dead. He's proving to Martha, you're looking forward to the resurrection someday. Well, I am the resurrection. We can have it right now. Because <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, verse 5. Jesus is telling them, I'm going away and you know the way. And Thomas is sort of literal here and doesn't like to beat around the bush. And he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am 
the way. I am the way. You're looking for the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Down in verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Lord, if you could just give us a glimpse of the Father, if you could just show us your Father, that would be fine. I mean, that would be awesome. We would be set for life. We would be, that's all we need. That's what he said. It's sufficient. It sufficeth us, the King James says. Show us the Father and it's sufficient. It's enough. That's all we need. And Jesus said to him, have I not been with you so have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me Philip he who has seen me has seen the father so how can you say show us the father what is my point Jesus in each of these cases is meeting needs by revealing himself and there's not a need in here tonight that you have and I I'm sure there are needs in here tonight there is not a need in here that you have tonight that Jesus cannot meet with himself. You discover Jesus to be the answer to your problems, the sufficiency of your life, because Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You want to know God better, you, you, get, you need to get to know Jesus better. You want to know the Father, Jesus says, I, he who's seen me has seen the Father. Now notice he said, he didn't say, I am the Father, because he's not the Father. But he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's how close, that's how close-knit the Trinity is. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Someone wrote, I could not find the path ahead. So blind with doubt, I could not see. A still small voice beside me said, My child, seek not the path, but me. I tried to bear the truth each day, but fell and could not carry through. I am the truth, I heard him say. Arise, and I will carry you. I searched for blessings from above, for life made rich by heaven's wealth. But then my Lord reached out in love, instead of gifts, He gave himself. From now until the journey's end, it matters not how far I roam. I'm walking close beside a friend. With him, I'm never far from home. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It gets better though. You are complete in him. Believers are complete in Christ. In Christ, we are filled with the fullness of God. The word complete here is the same root as fullness back in the previous verse. In Him dwells all the fullness. We're back in Colossians, by the way. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him. That's the same family of words there, complete and fullness. His fullness dwells in me. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, and I'm full in Him. I'm filled up. That's the idea here of fullness. Sometimes when you get a cup of coffee, they'll ask you, do you want me to leave room for what? Cream. And if they leave room for cream, sometimes people leave that like that much room for cream, as if you needed that much cream in your coffee, all right? But if if they give you a full cup of coffee, there's, there's little room there at the top. And that's the concept of being full. With, with Christ, we are, we are complete. There's no room for anything else. There's no need for anything else. The fullness of God in Christ also fills us. And it fills us in a sacred and appropriate sense. I'm not the Trinity. Okay? You're not the Trinity. You're not God. But the fullness of God dwells in you. Christ, dwe- Christ liveth in me. And in Christ is the fullness of Godhead bodily. That's pretty amazing. I'm connected to the God who rules this universe. He lives in me. And this is echoed throughout the New Testament. John writes that of His fullness have we all received and grace piled upon grace is the sense of that. John 1.16 Ephesians 3.19 tells us that knowing and understanding the love of God, 
The love of Christ fills us with the fullness of God. Flip over there to Ephesians 3, if you would. Ephesians 3. And look at verse 19. He wants us to understand. I'm going to go to verse 18. He wants us to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And what is the result of that? If we understand the love of Christ, we will be filled with all the fullness of God. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. You are filled up with Him. If you understand His love, you will be filled with the fullness of God. You get the sense that God wants us to be filled with Him. Ephesians 1.23 tells us that the church is Christ's body and it calls us the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Paul is going to continue to explain how complete we are and what it actually means to be in Christ. How are we complete? What does that actually look like? What does it mean? Well, we need to see back in Colossians that in Christ we are circumcised. Colossians 2 and look in verse 11. In Him, in Christ, there's our word, in Him, that concept, in Christ, we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, why does Paul talk about circumcision here? Because there were those that were going around in the Colossian church that said, if you believe on Jesus, that's great. But if you do not follow Jewish law, you are not a true child of God. That was actually being preached. And circumcision was the sign of compliance and keeping of God's covenant uh, with His chosen people Israel. And it's possibly the most troublesome example of the world's approach to spiritual things. Let me explain that. Paul has strongly denounced the philosophy of the world with its traditions, its regulations, its outright idolatry. He's saying you can't reduce the Christian life to a list of do's and don'ts, a set of behavior, an appearance. That's not what the Christian life is. But people stubbornly go back to that. And circumcision was instituted by God as a sign of the covenant in the Old Testament. We won't turn back there and read about it, but that was God's way of, of uh, having His people give an outward sign of their keeping of His covenant. Circumcision was instituted by God for that. But for hundreds of years, Jewish people had fixated on that. They had gotten distracted with that and viewed it as a magical type of, I'm going to use the word talisman. It was something that they viewed as almost magical of spirituality. If, you have, if you're circumcised, you're spiritual. If you're uncircumcised, you're not spiritual. And it was just a, it was a, almost a magical talisman of, of spirituality. The Lord exhorted His people, though, even in the Old Testament, to circumcise their hearts. I'm going to take you to one of these passages. You can turn there if you'd like. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I mean, this is in the Pentateuch. This is early on. He says to them, Deuteronomy 10, 16, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. So circumcise the foreskin of your heart. He's not talking about a physical circumcision here. He's talking about a spiritual circumcision of these people. He also mentions this in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. We won't turn there for time. But God wanted His people on the inside. Now, on the outside, He commanded it as well. But it was a picture of something. It was a picture of the submission of their hearts to the Lord. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen confronted the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, for their failure to obey all that the prophets had spoken. 
you know what he called them at the end? He looked at them and he maybe pointed his finger. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. To say that to a Pharisee was a death sentence. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. How dare you call a Pharisee uncircumcised? But he says, that is in your heart. You're not under submission to the Lord. You're at the center of your life. God is not. In Romans chapter 2, verse 25 through 29, Paul distinguishes, and it's, there's a lot of the word circumcision in here, and we almost get confused when we read this. But Paul says, circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. I'm going to stop there. And he says, if you keep the law, then yes, circumcision profits you because it's a picture of what you're actually doing on your heart. But if you're a breaker of the law, it doesn't matter what you are on the outside. You've broken the law on the inside. And he says, if this guy over here who is actually physically, he's not uh, observing this covenant, but he does keep the law. He says, shall not his circumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, uncircumcision, if it keep the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision transgress the law? He says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward according to the flesh. But he is a Jew, listen to this, who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit whose praise is not of men, but of God. So what is Paul talking about? He says, in Christ, we are circumcised. How are we circumcised? Go back to Colossians chapter 2. We're meandering about the Bible tonight. Colossians 2.11. In Him you also were circumcised. Listen to this carefully. Knowing what we know now, what Paul has written elsewhere, and what God has written elsewhere, with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It is the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. It is a spiritual circumcision. The body of sin is... Mentioned in Romans chapter 6, and it refers to our flesh. It refers to that part of us that wants to sin, that wants to touch the wet paint on the wall. It does not want to be governed by law. It wants to sin. And the body of flesh can be put aside. It can be rendered ineffective. That's what Romans 6 is. And God says we are circumcised in Christ by the circumcision made without hands by putting off that body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's not referring to uh, the eighth day in Jerusalem of Christ's life when he was literally circumcised in accordance to Jewish law. That's not what he's referring to. He's referring to the spiritual circumcision that Jesus Christ produces in a life that's given to him. And when you are united, when I'm united with Christ, God says we are spiritually circumcised in Christ. Now, you could get into... A, a lot of uh, other theological truth here. In Christ, we have kept all Jewish law. It's all, it all belongs to us. All of His righteousness belongs to me. Even the ceremonial righteousness, it's all fulfilled in Christ. I'm in Him, so I get, to, I get to be all of that. But what this verse, I believe, is talking about is God has circumcised us spiritually. He's given us that deliverance from the body of flesh. And without this circumcision, Paul says in verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Notice that, verse 13, he has, he has made you alive and you were dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh. Again, I believe this is a spiritual circumcision that we're talking about here. How is our flesh put off, as Paul describes here. How is that possible? Look at verse 12. Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God. Now, if you got lost on the circumcision, I can't even say it anymore. I said it way too much. If you got lost on that whole thing, 
then pay attention right here. This, this is where it gets absolutely amazing. We are united with Christ. We are buried with Christ. How is our flesh put off? How, how does God give us the victory? How does God give us the victory of the, over the body of sin, over our flesh? How does God do that? Well, in Christ we are buried. We are buried with Him, it says, verse 12, in baptism. Now, to baptize means to dip in the water, to dunk, to immerse. It can be a literal baptism, as we see often back in the baptistry here, or it can be a spiritual immersing into something. And we see that the circumcision of Christ, verse 11, was a spiritual circumcision, and the baptism here is a spiritual baptism. Hope you can follow the logic here. Paul is using these terms in their spiritual sense. He's saying you're not physically circumcised, you're spiritually circumcised by being baptized into Christ, spiritually baptized into Christ, immersed into Him. It's not referring to the moment that you're placed under the water in physical baptism. It's referring to being buried with Him by the spiritual baptism. Now, the physical baptism pictures that, doesn't it? When I go under the water, when I when you put someone under the water, it's buried with him. We even say it, buried with him, okay, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It's a picture of that. But it's a picture of something that the Holy Spirit does. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He immerses us into Christ. This baptism is accomplished by the Holy Spirit at our salvation. Again, this is not referring to to the baptismal tank behind me. It is referring to what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit immerses us into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 1, deals with this. It says, As many of us as were baptized, immersed into Jesus Christ, were immersed into His death. We're buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I was trying to think of a example of this. Once I mix cream and sugar into my coffee, you take a cup of coffee tomorrow morning or tonight if you're one of those strange people that drink coffee at night, um, but if you drink a cup of coffee in the morning and you use cream and sugar and you take the cream and you put the cream into your coffee and you put the sugar into your coffee and you stir it around and the sugar dissolves into the coffee and the cream dissolves into your coffee. When I do that tomorrow and I put the coffee into my thermos to take to church, I don't worry about leaving the cream and sugar behind. It's part of my coffee. I couldn't separate it if I tried. I could not separate the cream and the sugar from my coffee. It's been baptized into my coffee. It's been immersed into my coffee. And God, friends, has stirred you into Jesus Christ. You couldn't get out if you tried. You're immersed into Him. Whatever's true of Jesus is true of you. God has mixed our lives into Christ. We can never be separated from Him. Where He goes, we go. His death on the cross is my death and His burial is my burial. We're buried with Him by baptism. That means we died with Him. Not only that, we're raised. In Christ, we are raised. This resurrection is also through our immersion into Christ. Just as He was raised from the dead, we also walk in newness of life. This is all the working, the operation of God. Look at verse, um, verse 12. Buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. As God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, He raised me from the dead to newness of life. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 10, that Jesus, having died to sin, He doesn't die anymore. The life that He lived, He lives to God. We get to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin and alive to God as well. We're raised with Jesus Christ. Not only that, in Christ we are freed from the condemnation of the law. Freed from it. Let's read the next few verses here. 
verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We were dead in our trespasses, but God forgave them. The handwriting of requirements refers to the regulations of the law that we failed to keep. And they're all written down neatly on a sheet of paper, and that paper is contrary to us. It was nailed above our prison door. And it is what kept us there because it demanded justice. But it's like Jesus came down the hall of the prison and He pulled all the papers off the doors. He pulled them off the top of the doors and He made a stack of them and He went to His cross. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not deviating hardly at all from this. He's taken them out of the way and it says He nailed it to His cross. What did Jesus' cross say? They nailed a sign to Jesus' cross. What did it say? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And I'm not trying to be irreverent here, but I believe this is true. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, idolater, adulterer, liar, thief, God-hater, blasphemer. Those were nailed to His cross. Your sins, your nasty, filthy, dirty sins were nailed to His cross. And He died under those sins for you. All the other disgusting sins that we've ever committed were nailed to Jesus' cross it feels, it feels almost irreverent to say that in succession, but that's what Jesus did. He has made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He took the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us and nailed it to His cross. And really the law had its way. The law has to condemn me to death. It tells me what I can do, what I can't do. It tells me that if you do this, you're going to be punished. Well, I did this. But Jesus took the paper and He nailed it to His cross. And He was, pun he was punished for my sin. And as Paul says in verse 20, I died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. My relationship with it has ended. Because if I'm stirred into Jesus Christ, okay, follow me on this. If I'm stirred into Jesus Christ, if I'm dissolved into Him and He died for my transgressions, then who else died? The law has condemned me to death. And in Christ, I've died. The law has sentenced me. I've died. And something that wasn't expected happened. I came back to life. Can the law condemn me again? No, the penalty's been paid. Christ has paid the penalty. To condemn me again would be double jeopardy. I no longer have to relate to God through His law unless I choose to because the lawgiver Himself is my Father. I'm raised with Jesus Christ. I'm freed from the condemnation of the law. Not only that, in Christ I'm victorious over all principalities and powers. It says in verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. These people in Colossae said, you need to, we need to tell, talk to you about these angels and these intermediaries that will help you to approach God. And Jesus is the head of all of them. He made a public show of them, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. He took away their power to condemn me, made a public spectacle of them, a public show of principalities and powers. And we could get into the reasons that they are defeated. Really, the only power they had was the power of death. And that was by the law. But Jesus took the power, the sting of death. We don't have to be afraid of death anymore. There is no power that these principalities and authorities have over us whatsoever. The summary of all this, look down in chapter 3. Now, we have jumped around, but you remember last time we spoke of this, we looked at the, all of those verses between verse 15 and the end of the chapter. Look down at verse 3. 
He's just going to come out and say it here. For you died. You died. Friendship Baptist Church, you died. You're dead. Your life, it says, is hidden with Christ in God. You are immersed into Him. You're stirred into the Lord Jesus. You're dissolved into Him. You belong to Him and He belongs to you. That is an utterly life-changing truth. To be completely unified with Christ. It means something very special. And we're going to get into the practical nature of what that means in future messages. You can see in chapter 3 where Paul's headed with this. If you then, verse 1, were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Get your mind off of the basic principles of the world. Enough of tradition. Enough of the outward things. Enough of the list of behaviors and things that define your Christian life. Enough of that. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear in him, with Him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. He gives a list. And then He says, put on these other things. Put on the new man. This fullness of Christ, the fact that we are complete in Christ, we share Christ's life. We share Christ's power, His holiness, everything about Him. Was Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China. And Whitney and I were at a conference last week. And on our way to the conference, we listened to a good chunk of the book, Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, written by his son and daughter-in-law. And on the way back, we almost finished the book. I think we had an hour, hour and a half left of the book. Uh, but it was amazing just to hear all that in really compact time. And Hudson Taylor explained how this truth affected his life. I'm just going to let him do it uh, for us tonight. He wrote in a letter to his sister, he said, I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. I prayed, agonized, fasted, strove, made resolutions, read the word more diligently, sought more time for meditation, but all without avail. What's he missing? He's in the principles of the world. He's in the, the behaviors. And he's reducing the Christian life to a list and a set of behaviors. He said, every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. I knew that if only I could abide in Christ, all would be well. But I could not. I would begin the day with prayer, determined not to take my eye off Him for a moment, but met pressure of duties, sometimes very trying, and constant interruptions apt to be so wearing, caused me to forget Him. Then one's nerves get so fretted in this climate that temptations to irritability, hard thoughts, and sometimes unkind words are all the more difficult to control. Each day brought its register of sin and failure, of lack of power, all the time I felt assured that there was in Christ all I need. But the practical question was how to get it out. He was rich truly, but I was poor. He was strong, but I was weak. I knew full well that there was in the root, the stem, abundant fatness. But how to get it into my puny little branch was the question. As gradually light dawned, I saw that faith was the only requisite was the hand to lay hold on its fullness and make his, wake his fullness mine. But I had not this faith. I strove for faith, but it would not come. I tried to exercise it, but in vain. Seeing more and more the wondrous supply of grace laid up in Jesus, the fullness of our precious Savior, my guilt and helplessness seemed to increase. Sins committed appeared but as trifles compared with a sin of unbelief which was their cause, which would not take God at His word, but rather made Him a liar, when my agony of soul has reached, was reached its height, a sentence in a letter was used to remove the scales from my eyes and the, pre the Spirit of God revealed to me the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. I quote from memory, But how to get faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting in the faithful one. As I read, I saw it all. I looked to Jesus and saw that He had said, I will never leave thee. Ah, there is rest, I thought. 
I have striven in vain to rest in him. I'll strive no more, for has he not promised to abide with me, never to leave me, never to fail me? How great seemed my mistake in wishing to get the sap, the fullness out of him. I saw not only that Jesus will never leave me, but that I am a member of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The vine is not the root merely, but all. Root, stem, branches, twigs, leaves, flowers, fruit. Listen to these words. Can Christ be rich and I poor? Answer it. Can Christ be rich and I poor? No. You're scared to answer it. Can Christ be rich and we be poor? If we're living in union with Christ, can Christ be rich and we be poor? No. We're rich in Christ. We're complete in Christ. He, go, he says, can Christ be rich and I poor? Can your right hand be rich and your left poor? My right hand is holding thousands of dollars. Is my left hand poor? No, my left hand's a member of my right hand. It goes right through here and it gets the money too, okay? And that's, okay, it's, your right hand cannot be rich and your left poor. Or your head be well while your body starves. Has that ever happened to anybody here? Dr. Cutler, have you ever seen that? The head is well, but the body is starving. No, the... It's all together. Could a bank clerk say to a customer, it was only your hand, not you, that wrote that check? (laughs) Or, I cannot pay this sum to your hand, but only to yourself. He was realizing something. He was realizing, I am one with Jesus. And if Jesus is compassionate, guess what I am? I'm compassionate. I can put on His compassion. If Jesus is joyful, guess what I am? In my right hand, I'm joyful. My left hand feels like being grumpy right now. But over here is joy. I'm one with Him. I'm stirred into Him. I'm immersed into Him. He wrote in another letter, Oh, it is joy to feel Jesus living in you, to find your heart all taken up by Him, to be reminded of His love by His seeking communion with you at all times, not by your painful attempts to abide in Him. He is our life, our strength, our salvation. He is our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is our power for service and fruit bearing. And His bosom is our resting place now and forever. He was later asked, but are you always conscious of abiding in Christ? And he replied, while sleeping last night, Did I cease to abide in your home because I was unconscious of the fact? You ever think of that? When you're sleeping in your home, do you go somewhere else in the middle of the night because you're not consciously abiding in your house? No, when you're not consciously abiding in your house, you nevertheless are in your house. At least we hope so. And Hudson Taylor said, we can rest in Christ. He said, you should never be consciously not abiding in Christ. We should never be conscious of not abiding in Christ. His biographer continues, the secret of his own strength was not far to seek. Whenever work permitted, Mr. Taylor was in the habit of turning to a little harmonium, that's like an accordion, for refreshment, playing and singing many a favorite hymn, but always coming back to Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of of thy loving heart. One of the 18 evangelists, Mr. George Nichol, was with Hudson Taylor on one occasion when some letters were handed into his office bringing news of serious rioting in two of the older stations of the mission. Thinking that Mr. Taylor might wish to be alone, the younger man was about to withdraw when, to his surprise, someone began to whistle. It was the soft refrain of the same well-loved hymn, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. Turning back, Mr. Nichol could not help exclaiming, How can you whistle when our friends are in such danger? Would you have me anxious and troubled? Was the quiet reply. That would not help them and would certainly incapacitate me for my work. I have just to roll the burden on the Lord. Hudson Taylor had learned that for him, only one life was possible. Just that blessed life of resting and rejoicing in the Lord under all circumstances while he dealt with the difficulties inward and outward, great and small. 
Taylor learned that the power of his union with Christ was amazing. He didn't have to create the union. He just had to rejoice in it. He rejoiced in it by faith. And that is, that is the invitation to us tonight. You don't have to get into Christ tonight, folks. If you've believed on Jesus, you're in Him. You're in Him. You're connected. The problem is faith. You've not exercised the faith. You're not resting in your union with the Lord Jesus. Now, I need to clarify. I fully understand. I think Hudson Taylor knew this too. He's talking about rest and rest and rest. Hudson Taylor worked hard. He was a busy, busy man. He was a sick man. There's still labor involved in resting in Christ. Paul wrote in this very book just a few verses ago, Colossians 1.29, he says, I labor, I labor, that means work. I'm striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Paul also wrote to the Philippians, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's God who works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And you separate the labor from Christ if you separate the labor from Christ, you put yourself in the position where Hudson Taylor was before discovering this truth. So what does all this mean to us? What is Paul saying? He's saying, walk in Christ. You remember way up in chapter 2, verse 6? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Walk in Him. Live in Him. Day to day, live in Him. In the Lord Jesus. Paul says, Beware, verse 8, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's not according to Christ. For verse 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. So beware of these things that would pull you away from knowing Jesus. Refuse to allow yourself to reduce the Christian life to a set of behaviors. That's death. Christian life's not about your behaviors. Now, you're going to behave if you're a Christian. <laughs> But it's from knowing Jesus. It springs from your relationship with Him. Seek those things that are above. That's what Paul's going to tell us next. We are complete in Him, who's the head of all principality and power. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for this mighty, life-changing truth. Lord, perhaps there are some in here who need this truth tonight. We all need it, but your Spirit is working on their heart, showing them some area of their life, Lord, that you desire to manifest your fullness and their completion in you, their being complete in you. Help them, Lord, to stop striving after performance. Help them to rest in who you are. Help them to find the greatness of your loving heart to be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do eternal work right here, right now, in this room tonight, for your Son's sake, for your glory's sake. Lord, confront our hearts about the fullness that you desire to manifest in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymnals. I had one song picked out, but as I preached and thought about this, I want to sing the song that Hudson Taylor loved so much. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. And it is um, 481. 481. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. Sing this as a prayer to him. And as you sing... Commit yourself to resting in that fullness that He provides. Let's stand together as we sing. 481. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy love.
hast made me whole. Amen. Hope you'll meditate on that truth this week. You're dismissed.